If you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through uh, 33. We're going to finish out the chapter. So, this morning, as we look at our passage, it is about marriage. So, I try to send my manuscript to Jonah uh, sometime during the week uh, so that he can kind of uh, match the songs to what we're talking about. And so, told him that we're doing marriage, and so he picks a song that has uh, talk about suffering in the middle of it. So, I don't know, I don't know if Jonah's trying to say something or. Sorry. It was just there. All right, so the passage we're looking at this morning is a very important passage. It's a very uh, good passage, but it's also a passage that is not uh, popular uh, in our world today, Uh, especially the first verse that we will look at in verse 22, where it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. But it is is good for us to look at, and really the, the ultimate reason why it is good for us to look at is because God, as the author of the Bible, God is the author of creation. God is also the author of marriage. And so if we want to have godly marriages, if we want to have marriages that are not perfect, and we won't have anything perfect until we get to heaven, but if we want to have marriages that, that exalt God and operate the way that God had in, intended them for, to, to operate, then we need to follow His instructions. So last weekend, uh, Jess and I gave the kids a, an early Christmas present. It's one of those, it's an outside play thing. It's one of those things that's like a dome uh, that's kind of like a spider web or something. It's a bunch of bars just kind of bolted together. Uh, they can climb on it and hang on it. Well, I was looking at the instructions, and you have to put the bars, like five or six will get bolted together in a spot, and they had to go in a certain order because there were some caps that go on the outside that the kids can use to hold on. And so we put all of this thing together, and we go to put the cap on, and I was inside the dome reading the instructions, but the instructions were meant to be read from the outside. So everything was backwards. So we had to go to every connecting joint, unbolt it, rearrange the six bars, and bolt them back together. What should have taken about an hour took about three hours because I messed up the instructions. So if we want to have marriages that are God-honoring, that are glorifying, that are moving in the right direction, that encourage us, that operate the, the way that God has intended marriage to operate, then we need to follow the instructions. And so before we look at the passage, I've got two kind of qualifiers or two understandings that I want us to have as we move into this this morning. One, keep your elbows tucked in. No elbowing your husband or wife because of something that said and said, Pay attention, listen hard. We don't get to do that. And two, understand that I'm not preaching this from the position of I've got all of this down pat. This is not on the authority of me or my experiences. This is on the authority of of God and his word. Uh, So as I preach this, this is not saying, hey guys, uh, y'all measure up to me. This is saying, hey, let's all of us strive to measure up to God and his word. So one, one last thing, if you're not married, then let me encourage you to take this time to pray for those who are, uh, or if you look to get fut- or married in the future, kind of understand what God is setting as his standard. Jonah, you're getting close, man. I mean, you're, you're getting older. All right. Sorry, that's two. I, I, I'm done. I'm done, Jonah. I'm done. All right, if you've got your Bible, I'm going to ask that you stand, if you're able, in the honor and reading of God's Word. Uh, we're going to read Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, um, then we'll pray, and then you may be seated. Paul writes, through, or God through Paul writes, excuse me, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as, she, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. 
because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound that I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you now. Just thank you for this time that you've given us, God, this opportunity to worship you, Father, through the study of your word. Father God, I pray that as we open up your word, as we open up your truth, God, I pray that you would speak. God, I pray that you, through your word, through the Holy Spirit, that you would challenge us, encourage us, uh, meet us where we're at with what we need. And Father God, may we strive to walk with you in every way that we possibly can. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so let's start off. I mean, we're just going to dive right into it in verses 22 through 24. Now, verses, verse 22 is an unpopular verse because it has been twisted from what God has originally meant for it to be. Some people look at this verse and say that this is demeaning towards women or that it makes uh, women second-class citizens. Or they'll look at this verse and they say, well, this just means that God loves men more than he likes women and God views women as less than. And none of that, absolutely none of that is true. In fact, as we look at this, I think one thing that we'll see is there is a measure of grace uh, of God given to in the marriage to the wife uh, within these roles that he establishes. But also, what we're going to see is the majority of this passage, as we look at the passage as a whole, is not about the responsibility or the role of the wife in the marriage, but it's about the responsibility of the husband and really the weight that comes with that leadership. So the first thing that we see this morning in verse 22 is that in a God-honoring marriage, the responsibility of a wife is to respect her husband's leadership. <clears throat> now, last week we looked at the word submit back in verse 21. It said, submitting to one another out of reverence uh, for Christ. And we talked about how as the church that there is this kind of mutual submission with all of us where we are uh, laying aside our rights, that we are laying aside our wants for the sake of others for the sake of, of loving others and coming alongside of each other. So here, Paul takes that same word and applies it in the marriage. And it does, it does set up an order within the marriage that the, the husband is the head and the wife is to submit to the leadership uh, of her husband. So that's very simple explanation. But what I want us to do is take a minute and just kind of look at some things that submission is in the marriage and some things that it is not. Because I think a lot of this has gotten twisted just over the world or over time and in our culture. So the first thing is this. Submission is about leadership, not equality. So when we look at submission in Scripture, in the marriage, it's about uh, leadership. It's about uh, who's taking point, who, who has to bear the responsibility of the final decision. It's not about equality. This is not a declaration from God that he loves men more than he loves women, or that men are greater than women, or that men are more important than women. None of that is true. From God's perspective, God has created man and woman equal. Men and women are equal. Now, we have different roles. We have different responsibilities. We are created differently so that we do different things. But men and women, in God's eyes, are equal. On top of that, in salvation, we are both saved the same. We are saved to the same Christ. So we are saved to the same faith. We are saved to the same uh, eternity and the same promise and the same gift. As we talk about leadership, as we talk about headship, as we talk about these standards that God has said in his word, this is not to say that there is this unequal balance and that somehow one gender or one sex is greater than the other. This is simply establishing the role of leadership within the family. I think that's important to note. Second, submission is willful, not forced. The whole idea of the word submit is that this is a willful laying down uh, to the leadership in this context of another. This is not forced. This is not something that the husband forces upon the wife and says, you will submit or else. This comes from the heart of the wife who seeks to as Paul writes here, respect the leadership of her husband who seeks to love God and worship him. So she willfully uh, sets aside that aspect of life to say, I will follow the leadership of my spouse, of my husband. So this is not about force. This is not about dominance or domineering. This is a willful submission on the role of the wife. Next, submission is a choice to follow, not obedience. 
Understand this. Submission is a choice to follow. It's that willful idea again. This is not obedience. Next week, when we look at chapter 6, verse 1, we're going to see the commandment where Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So there is a commandment to obey for obedience, but it's not husband to wife, it's parent to child. This is important because when there is a call to obedience and disobedience happens, then discipline comes. So we give our kids commandments. We give our kids, hey, here's the rules for our house. If our kids break those rules, then they get some kind of punishment. Maybe it's a spanking. Maybe it's grounded. Maybe it's extra chores, whatever it is. So obedience means uh, discipline or punishment when that obedience is not met. The call for submission is not a call for obedience. I do not have the right as her husband to tell Jessica, go make me a sandwich, and if you don't, then you don't get your uh, allowance this week. She doesn't get an allowance. But I don't have that. She doesn't have to obey everything that I say. That's not what is being discussed here. That's not what is being presented here. This is not I'm the king and she has to obey uh, everything that I say like she's a loyal subject. This is a willful submission that she chooses to say, you're the leader, which we'll see in a second as we discuss things. Understand that the, um, the weight of the decision, the weight of the responsibility of leadership ultimately falls on your shoulders next submission is not a lack of influence in the marriage so here's where we're going to spend most of our time when it comes to this this aspect of the marriage the 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 wife this this verse so going back to ephesians 5 21 submit to one another out of reverence for christ the idea of that is putting each other first uh, each person submitting to the other uh, within, within the confines of Christianity, within the confines of the church, uh, for the sake of unity, for the sake of moving forward, for the sake of, of, of glorifying and honor God. Well, if you have a husband and wife who are both Christians, then yes, there is a, a role of, of leadership uh, within the, the marriage, but also as believers, there is this this mutual submission towards one another. There's this mutual acknowledgement of each one's walk with God. There's this mutual acknowledgement to say, uh, God speaks to you, God works in your life uh, in the same way that he does mine. And I should um, trust you and look to you and surrender to your, uh, submit uh, part of my, my spiritual walk and our, our unity uh, comes together. Within the marriage, there is a form of, of mutual submission. Listen to what Paul says in uh, Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. It says, The husband should give his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Within the Christian marriage, there is this, this mutual, um, I don't want to use the term ownership, but this mutual relationship where, where both have influence and impact and, and some form of um, influence in each other's life. What this means is my wife has every right to speak truth into my life. I'm not just this kind of spiritual head and I tell her everything and, and she doesn't get to say anything to me. No, my wife has equal rights in decision making. My wife has equal rights spiritually to, to pray for me, to pray for our family. My wife has every right if I am in sin or if I'm walking uh, an unwise uh, manner for her to confront me and say, this is not right. She does not have to sit back like a little church mouse and not say anything. She has every right and love and grace and compassion as a fellow believer in Christ to present and speak truth into my life. In fact, there have been times, multiple times, in our marriage where we have discussed things, decisions that we needed to make for our family, where her wisdom supersedes and exceeds mine, where her uh, thoughts and her ideas are greater than mine. And that means that a lot of times, hers went out because she has a walk with God. God leads her. God directs her. God has gifted her with wisdom and discernment. And so there is, there is a wisdom within the family for us to come together to make these decisions. 
Proverbs 15, 22 says, Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Understand that uh, within a marriage, there has to be this mutual discussion, this mutual understanding, this mutual freedom to be able to speak into each other's life. It's not dominance. It's not domineering. It's not overpowering. It's not one greater than the other. It's two people coming together to be one flesh equally within the marriage. Now, yes, sometimes as leadership, uh, Jessica has to say, here's everything that I think, but ultimately this decision, you, you make the final decision. There's probably only been a handful of times in our marriage where that's actually come to that. But we are to come together with this mutual submission towards each other in love and in grace and in compassion. And then finally, submission is to be done in worship for Christ. So the verse says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Real fast, I missed this. Where it says your own husbands, I missed this point earlier. Wives submit to their husbands. Not every other man. This is within the confines of a marriage. This is not uh, every man has authority over every woman. This is husband and wife. So this is to be done in worship to the Lord or worship to Christ. Ultimately, do you know why Jessica should submit to the leadership, my leadership in our home? It's not because I'm all-knowing. It's not because I get everything right. It's not because I always love her the best way that I can and should. It's because she loves Jesus. And because this is what God has commanded. And because this is what God has commanded, this is what, how she lives to honor and to worship Him. It's not because I complete her. I don't. Christ completes her. And so she is completed in Christ. And so therefore, she worships Christ. And one of the ways that she worships Christ is through submission in the marriage. Now, the rest of this passage honestly deals with the responsibility of leadership that God places on the husband. And so the first thing that we're going to see is that with leadership comes responsibility. Verses 23 and 24 say this. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So what Paul does in this passage is he uses the illustration of Christ and the church and and compares that to marriage. So one of the great things about marriage is that marriage is a picture of Christ and his relationship to the church. That's one reason why marriage is so important. That's why the reason why marriages should be fought for. That's one of the reasons why I believe the Bible tells us that God hates divorce is because marriage reflects back, or is a, it's a picture, it's a living illustration of God's relationship with the church through Christ. And so in this, where he talks about the head of the family or the head of the wife, The idea of headship is all about responsibility. The idea of headship is who is bearing the weight of the choices that are being made. And probably the best illustration of headship is found in the Garden of Eden. So if you look back, and and you don't have to flip there, but if you look back at the Garden, in Genesis chapter 2, God tells Adam the commandment, um, you can eat of any tree in the Garden, but the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil Do not eat from that tree. Well, chapter 3, which describes the fall, the serpent comes and tempts Eve. Begins to question, well, did God really say? And it tells us that once Eve eats the fruit, she turns and gives some to Adam, her husband, who is there with her. So yes, Eve sinned. But understand, when it comes to being the head, when it comes to the responsibility... Adam bears the majority of the responsibility, not even just for that marriage, but for all of humanity. When Adam is given his commandment, he talks, God talks about the thorns and the, the ground is going to be hard. Adam's sin did not just impact him, but it impacted creation. Not only that, but the rest of the New Testament tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came in the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. 
What these verses tell us is that from God's perspective, because Adam was acting as the head, not only of his family, but as the head of, uh, as a representative for humanity, because Adam sinned, because he was the head, he is now bearing that brunt or bearing that responsibility that comes with being the head or that comes with headship. So husbands, understand. Wives, understand that when we talk about the authority that God has placed in the family, it falls on the shoulders of the husband. The responsibility does. If, they're, if you're at work and something just, just goes chaotic, who's the first one that kind of everyone runs to? It's the leader. If there was something happening in our uh, youth ministry, we have a good youth ministry, this is solely an illustration. But if there was just chaos happening in our youth ministry, guess what's the first place I'm going to go? Guess who's the first person I'm going to talk to who's going to bear the responsibility of whatever is going on? It's going to be Zach, our youth pastor, the leader. If something chaotic is going on in this church, guess where everyone's eyes are going to look? On me, because I'm the leader. Therefore, responsibility, the weight that comes with that, sits on my shoulders or the leader's shoulders so as we talk about headship as we talk about leadership that's where i think that there is some grace shown because yes eve was responsible for her sins anyone in this room you are responsible for your sin but when we look at the health of the family guess where we have to look we have to look to the husband how is the husband leading? How is he loving his wife? How is he loving his children? Now, that doesn't mean that if he does everything perfect, everything works out perfect. But where does the brunt of responsibility fall? It falls on the head. It falls on the husband. So now we look at how the husband is to love. So a husband's leadership is based in love. Verse 25. So we all want to look at verse 22 and say, wives, well, submit to your husbands. Oftentimes we forget verse 25 that says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So first, let's look at love, and then we're going to look at that, that, that standard that we are set. So there's so many different definitions of love that are good definitions. But basically, if we wanted to kind of boil it down to the most simple way we can, love is action accompanied by emotion. So if I love my wife, I'm going to show that in actions, and I'm going to seek to do what is best for her. I'm going to seek to, uh, to, to do what, what benefits her uh, even above myself. I lower myself, I lift her up, and it is accompanied by emotions. It's never emotions first because emotions are fickle, emotions fail. It is, it, it is led by a decision that says, I'm going to put her first. And that, that will be accompanied by all the feelings and the butterflies and everything else. Now, I was listening to a sermon this week or watching a sermon this week by a guy named Paul Washer. So I'm stealing this illustration from him. or I'm borrowing this illustration from him. So it's one thing to say that we love our spouses. It's one thing for husbands for you to look at your wife and say, I love you. Love is more than words. And, and it has to be shown in more than words. So uh, let's put uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13 up on the screen. So I'm going to read this. Well, actually, it's on the screen. Let's just all read it together out loud. All right. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, as an illustration or as an example, now I don't, I don't, y'all, I will do this out loud. Y'all don't have to say this out loud. It's one thing to say, I love my wife. Because we use that word love for, for many things. I love Ole Miss football, even though they got slaughtered yesterday by LSU. I love Wendy's spicy chicken sandwich. But I don't use that word in the same way that I talk about loving my wife, or at least I shouldn't. Uh, it should mean something different. So if you want to feel convicted, men and, and even women, because this goes both ways, but specifically what we're talking about here is the husband loving your wife, do this. Go through this and replace where it says uh, love, replace that with yourself. So let me, let me illustrate this. So, love is patient and kind. 
I am patient with Jessica. I am kind towards Jessica. I do not boast about myself or I'm not arrogant towards Jessica. I do not envy her successes or her blessings. When, when God blesses her, I don't think, well, why not me? I'm not rude towards her. I don't insist on getting my way over hers. I'm not irritable towards her. I'm not resentful of her. I rejoice when she does good and in righteousness. I bear her burdens with her. I trust her and I will endure with her. Now, I'm going to be honest, as I read that in that capacity, I am convicted about how much my life does not match 1 Corinthians 13. I'm convicted of how much my love for my wife does not live up to that standard. But if we're going to say we love our wives, men, if we're going to be called to love our wife as Christ has loved the church, biblically, this is what that means. This is how that is lived out. This is how that is shown. It's not just saying, hey, baby, I love you. I am patient with you. I'm kind towards you. I'm not irritable towards you. I I bear all things with you. I endure with you. So men, if we're being honest, just in your heart, between you and God, where are we hitting at with this? He then goes on to show how the husband's love is to be defined by Jesus. So the rest of verse 25 says, As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, then he continues on in 28 through 32, and it says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He should love his wife, um, he should... He who loves his wife, excuse me, loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So once again, using that illustration of Christ of the church and Christ and the church, he sets up kind of this incredibly tall order for what love is to look like, especially for husbands towards their wives. He says, you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? Perfectly. He sacrificed for her. Christ stepped out of heaven to come to earth to put on human flesh. He humbled himself to the point of death, death on the cross for you and for me. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. If we have placed our faith and trust in him, then we are his. We are his bride. And so as we look at how we are to love our wives, we look at how Christ loved the church. He sacrificed. He laid down his life. He sought what was best for her, for the church. He laid down his own life so that the church could be formed and created so that we could be saved. So husbands, if we look at love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that's a call to sacrifice. That's a call to service. That's a call to humility. That's not a call to say, I'm the king of my, uh, ca- of my castle or my kingdom. That's to be like Christ and be that leader that washes feet and that humbles himself to serve his spouse, to put her and her needs above your own, to put her and her desires above your own, to seek her best and to seek her good above ours. Men, If you want to know what the priority life of your the priority of your life should look like, that list: God first, then your spouse, then your kids, then probably work, and then household. And we're kind of at the bottom. Our wants, our desires, our needs. That comes. That comes at the bottom. The call here to love your spouse, to love your wife as Christ loved the church, this is a call to sacrifice all of who you are for the benefit of the people that God has placed in your life. To sacrifice for their good, to sacrifice for their value, to sacrifice that they are, that they feel loved, that they feel worthy, that they feel worth something. 
Our worth is defined by Christ's sacrifice. He loved us enough that he stepped out of heaven, he lived perfection, he died on the cross, and he rose again that we might have life. That's where our value comes from. We are to live sacrificially for it so that our wives feel valued by us giving all that we can and putting everything above ourselves to love them, to value them, and to show how important they are. That's what it means to love your wife as Christ has loved the church. Next, verses 26 to 27, and we're getting close to the end. The goal of a husband's love is the spiritual maturity of his wife. So continuing with this illustration, verses 26 and 27, he says that he might sanctify her. What is sanctification or what is sanctify means? Moving closer to Jesus. Moving farther from sin, closer to Jesus. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, uh, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that that she might be holy and without blemish. So Christ's goal for the church is that when we place our faith and trust in Christ, that's justification. That's when we uh, we acknowledge that we are sinners, uh, we turn to Christ in faith, we turn to Christ and we are saved. Then we have the end, glorification. That's when we get to go to heaven. That's when everything is made right. And everything in the middle, from, from salvation to death, when we step into the throne room of God or we step into heaven, is sanctification. And this is the process as believers where we are looking less and less like ourselves and we are striving to obey God and follow God and and we're fighting against our sin and we're sinning less and we're walking in righteousness more. That's where we're at in life. That's our, our goal. God's goal or Christ's goal for the church is our sanctification, that we are sanctified so that we are presented to him as a bride at the end of time, holy and blameless. Now, this is the illustration that he is using for husbands and wives, especially for the love a a husband has for his wife. Husbands, your chief goal for your your wife is not a clean house. It's not uh, uh, laundry being uh, washed and folded and and in the drawers uh, every single day. It's not a meal on your table every time you walk in. Your chief goal for your wife is that she loves Jesus more and more every day. That's how you pray for her. That's what you want for her. That's what you encourage her in. You encourage her to spend time in God's Word. You pray with her. You you listen to her when she has burdens or she is struggling and she's asking you to pray for her. Your goal, your chief goal in life is to walk with her so that you are both getting closer to Jesus. Above everything else. And I'm not saying there's not other household responsibilities that have to be taken care of. But your chief goal in loving your wife is how can I help you love Jesus more? This morning we looked at uh, Genesis chapter 3 in Sunday school and we talked about Adam and Eve and how you know Adam was right there with Eve when she the serpent was tempting her and then when she ate the fruit she gave some to, to Adam. The Bible says that he was right there with her. Adam failed in his leadership. And we saw a second ago how that impacts everything and everybody, but why did he fail? Really probably two main reasons. One, he wanted the the path of least resistance, right? Happy wife, happy life. Go do whatever you want as long as you're happy and as long as I don't have to deal with it, you just go do what you do. Go do what you want to do. And he loved his wife more than he loved God. So he said, eat the fruit. That's fine. I know God has told us not to. I know God said, don't eat this. But if that's what you want to do, you go do. Loving your wife does not mean, hey, live in all the sin that you want. And I just want you to be happy no matter what that looks like. Loving your wife means walking alongside of her. To see her love Jesus more and more. To be kind to be compassionate, to pray for her, to understand. Look, one of the things that Jessica and I have learned that we say a lot, and I say a lot in in marriage counseling too, is I cannot change Jessica and she cannot change me. She can't. She can't force me to do anything that I don't want to do. I'm bigger and stronger than her. And in the same way, I can't force her to do anything that she wants to do or change anything about her. But I can pray for her. 
I can present her with scripture and truth. I can, can strive to walk alongside of her and her me because ultimately the only thing that's going to change me is God. And so if I'm going to want to see God work in my wife's life, then I need to walk alongside of her spiritually. I need to pray for her. I need to uh, uh, read Scripture together with her or talk about Scripture together or talk about what we're learning uh, uh, in God's Word, even separately, and then come together and talk about it. And it doesn't, there's no one way that this has to look, but I need to be engaging her spiritually to help her and likewise her helping me move closer to Jesus. But my chief goal, my chief desire for her is that she loves Jesus more because honestly if I'm going to love her that's the best thing that I can hope for her for her the most important thing in our life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and so if I want what is best for her I want her to love Jesus more and more and more and so I need to be encouraging her in that in any and every way that I can and then Paul closes out and we see that a godly marriage is built on love and respect However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So here Paul sums it all up. If we want a marriage that is God-honoring, if we want a marriage that we're going to follow the, uh, the instructions given by the author, given by the creator, wives, respect your husband's leadership. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. Now I understand those are two tall orders. Those are two huge commandments that God, has, that God has placed on us. But they're there nonetheless. The great thing is, as believers, God has empowered us to follow his commandments. What we have to do is submit. What we have to do is surrender to him. And understand this. You might be in a marriage, ladies where your husband does not love you as Christ loves the church. That doesn't change your responsibility. Husbands, you might be in a marriage where your wife does not respect you one iota and she lets you know that 24-7. That does not change your responsibility to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Sin does not justify sin. Disobedience does not justify further disobedience. Women, if you are in a marriage where your husband does not love you as Christ, maybe he's not even a Christian, you are still to honor him and respect him and worship God through respecting him as the leadership of the home. Husbands, if your wife thinks that you are a moron and does not think that you have a, a, a decent idea in your brain, you are still called to love her as Christ has loved the church. And I believe in what I've seen in other marriages and discussing with other people, reading books and things of that nature, is that when you're in one of those situations, if you're going to respond in a godly way, God uses that to draw people closer to Him. But when we respond in, well, if she's not going to respect me, then I'm not going to love her. Or if he's not going to love me, then I'm not going to respect him. That separates But when we love and we respect, regardless of how what we're receiving in return, that draws together. That's what God wants. God wants marriages where we are growing closer to Him and closer to each other. So what do we do next? Where do we go from here? One, if you're not living up to the standards that God has set, confess that to God. Confess that to your spouse. In all honesty, I think it was Thursday or Friday, I walked into our bedroom and I said, Jessica... I'm sorry that I've not been the spiritual leader in our home that I need to be. And I had to own up to that. I had to confess that. If you're not, then I, I don't say that to brag about myself. Trust me, I don't. What I'm telling us is that if we're not doing what God has called us to do, the first step of that is confession and repentance. And yes, it happens before God, but sometimes it happens before other people. And we have to go, we have to confess, and we have to say, look, here's where I'm messing up. Forgive me. Help me do better. Encourage me. Strengthen me. Walk alongside of me. Whatever it is that we need. Go to your spouse and say, hey, here's why I'm failing and I'm sorry and I want to change. 
Husbands, I would encourage you to go to 1 Corinthians 13 and look at those verses and do what we did, do that exercise where you put your uh, eye and you finish it up with your wife's name and, and, and see where you're at. Because honestly, husbands, if we are loving our wives as Christ loves the church, respecting leadership becomes fairly easy for the wife. But if we're not, understand one verse of this was, hey wife, here's your role. And everything else was husband, here's your. And it's not because the husband's more important. It's because the health of the family rests on the headship and the leadership of the husband. 